Scott Brady is joining us. Um, he's the, uh, the assistant head coach and defense coordinator at McMaster University. Um, was at Mount Allison before and, and was one of the, uh, the big reasons that Mount A became a respectable uh, program again. And, and that's because of his hard work. And he's out there uh, studying with all the different CFL coaches we're doing defensively and put his own wrinkles to it. And he's done a great job with it. So take it over, Scott. Thanks, Jarvis. Uh, I'm just going to jump right into it here. So I'm just going to share my screen first. All right. So yeah, Paul just asked me to talk about um, some pressure stuff tonight. So I thought I would do uh, one of the type of pressures that we spend a lot of time on, which is our fire zone pressures here. So in terms of what I'm going to be talking about, I thought I'd start just by going through a little bit of what they are and kind of the philosophy and theory behind them in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, give you guys some thoughts about how we go about game planning them both against the run and the pass game. Uh, and then show some film of a couple examples uh, of what we've used this past season. All right, so in terms of our fire zones, the, we've got a couple different categories of zone pressures, but typically with our fire zones, we're talking about a five-man rush with three deep, four underneath coverage behind it. So typically it's a double hold concept, but depending on what you want to accomplish or what you want to take away, you can mix different three deep concepts in behind the pressure. Really for us, we just look at it from the standpoint of it's an exchange of one underneath dropper for a fifth rusher. And so if you look at your typical cover three, typically you've got two hook curl defenders and over the ball middle dropper. And really we're just exchanging either a hook curl or that middle dropper for the benefit of getting a fifth rusher. That fifth rusher, you're going to try to find a good matchup, whether it's against their worst offensive linemen, their running back in protection, or if you're attacking the run game, trying to um, put him at the likely point of attack against the run. And, and so for us, I think that's a pretty good trade-off, especially if you struggle to get pressure with your front four. You know, if you can add a fifth rusher to it, but not make your, leave a huge void in coverage, um, it tends to be a pretty good trade-off. One of the things that we like about it is that it's really, really multiple concept once you've installed the concept and taught it to the guys. And, and you can show a bunch of different looks depending on what front you're running or what type of personnel you have. So I just put a couple of the different rush possibilities there. But sometimes it's as simple, especially on first down, is just bring one second level defender, you know, whether it's an in the box linebacker if you want to plug inside run or bring an overhang defender like the Sam or the weak half if you think the ball's going to hit off tackle. If you bring two or more um, second level defenders, kind of what most people think of when they think zone blitz is that defensive lineman dropping into coverage, which is part of it, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And a lot of times, especially on first down, you're not necessarily dropping one of those guys out. It's really just bring one second level guy um, to the pass rush. And then for guys who do use a 30 front, um, or even for us, like we're a base 40 team, but we'll get into a three-man front a good amount of the time on second and long. One of the benefits of that is now you can bring two second-level defenders, um, but you don't have to drop one of the defensive linemen into coverage. So there's some issue with that potentially on rundowns, depending on what you're seeing. But in terms of pass rush, not having to put a defensive lineman into coverage um, and still get the added benefit of two second-level guys rushing the quarterback, I, I think is pretty good. Um, just before I get into what we're trying to accomplish and why we like our zone pressures, the big couple of things that we talk to our guys about every single week are explosive plays and takeaways. And all the research out there in terms of what leads to success on the field on game day, really those are the two most important factors in winning is explosive play margin and turnover margin. So for us, for our game goals, we want to give up less than four explosive plays in every single game and we want to have three or more takeaways. And I just put this in here, this chart at the bottom, which is a little bit tough to read, but this is what we would present to our guys every Sunday um, when we're recapping the previous game. And these are all of our game goals or score goals on defense for every game. But really the two big ones here are the takeaways and the big plays. And what I love about this is it really corresponds really, really well with whether or not we were able to win the game on the weekend. So the two games that we lost during the season were this week three game against Western, this week eight game against Carlton. 
those were the only two weeks where we didn't hit our three plus takeaway margin. So we just had the one week three against Western. We didn't have any week eight against Carlton. And then the explosive play margin, we actually got that one in the week three game. Um, but the one game that we gave up more than four explosive plays was that week eight Carlton game where we gave up two on the ground and four through the air. So I'll tie that back to the fire zones and why we like them in a minute. But I, I think anything that you're doing on defense, explosive plays and takeaways have to be a primary focus and you have to have answers for how you're going to succeed, teach and do well at those things with any concept that you're going to put in on defense. Um, specific to our fire zones, you know, a lot of the reason that we like these type of pressures is because um, I think it benefits us in terms of being successful at eliminating explosive plays and creating takeaways. And so looking specifically at explosive plays, you know, when I first started learning it, one of the things that I said, the phrase that kind of stuck with me is the idea of getting safe pressure. Like you want to bring pressure, you want to dictate how the game is going to be played you want to force the offense to do or not do certain things and you want to be the aggressor, but you don't want to consistently be exposing yourself to, to the opportunity to give up the 20 plus yard gain through the air. And so, you know, the nice thing with our zone pressures is you bring rushers hopefully to, to the part of the field or the part of the protection that you would like to attack. But even if the offense does a good job picking it up, if you make mistakes on the front end, you get guys out of the wrong gap, whatever the case is, at the end of the day, you're still playing three deep zone coverage behind it, and you've got 12 guys with eyes inside on the football. And so it, it gives you a good chance that your mistakes now are 10 to 12 yard gain instead of that 15 plus yard run or 20 plus yard pass through the air. And so where you get beat, you're likely not giving up the explosive play, and you've got an opportunity um, to, to play another down. You know, if you look at man pressure, and we'll still do some of it, but one of the things that can come up with man pressure is one guy falls down, one guy gets beat in man is potentially a touchdown. You don't have those concerns really with your zone pressure. Um, the other couple of things in terms of eliminating the explosive plays, really the issue in coverage with our zone pressures is going to be short and outside the numbers. So especially if you're playing a double hole concept in behind it, where it's going to be weak is the widest part of the field for the, the, the shortest potential gain. And so we like the ball being thrown there. If they're doing it a lot, you don't necessarily want to be in it. And maybe on second and medium where they're likely to throw the ball outside the numbers and short and can pick up a first down, it's not what you want to be in. Um, but on base downs or second and long situations, forcing throws against pressure short and outside the numbers it is going to give you a good chance for success. And then the other big one is in the run game. You know, you'll still do some zeros and stuff um, when you want to attack the run. But I like the fact, like I said earlier, that you've got 12 sets of eyes inside if the ball breaks. So if you do make a mistake with your gap control up front, if somebody gets out of the wrong gap, um, you miss a tackle, whatever the case is, or they run away from your pressure, you've still got guys with eyes inside. So if the ball breaks the line, you've got a chance to get it on the ground. If you're looking at your zeros and stuff, now you've basically got everybody on the same level. And so one mistake can, again, potentially be that explosive play. Um, and then again, in terms of creating takeaways, the big thing for us really, it all starts with the opposing quarterback. And so we want to make them consistently make throws um, and have to find windows in zone against pressure. Now, some quarterbacks, you'll play the odd one who's really adept at, and then you potentially have to do some different things. But week to week for us with the quarterbacks that we see, there's just not, frankly, a lot of them that are, are going to be comfortable when there's immediate pressure in their face that they can hang in there and make those tight window throws downfield, even if you are avoiding an underneath zone. Um, the other big one with any of the pressures, whatever it is, and this isn't exclusive to fire zones, but I think the big thing that we talk to our guys about is we want to force the other team's quarterback to make as many of their decisions post-snap as possible. So that comes down to the disguise of your pressure, to disguise of your coverage. I think even the, the average or okay quarterbacks, if you let them know what the coverage is or where the pressure is coming from before the snap, even the okay ones are able to beat that. It takes a really, really exceptional quarterback where they don't know what you're going to be in or they think you're going to be in one thing until the very second that the ball snapped. And now they have to start their decision-making process with 
again, potentially five rushers trying to take his head off after the ball snaps. So in terms of disguise, whether it's pressure, coverage, um, we want the quarterback making as many of their decisions as we possibly can post-snap. Um, against teams that run the ball really well, I think one of the benefits to these type of pressures, depending on who you bring, um, if you bring guys from outside of the box count, it makes it a lot tougher on the offensive line. So like on our checklist of who we're going to game plan against and who we want to affect, certainly number one is the quarterback, but right behind that is the offensive line. And so if you give them a static front, like everybody knows how to block an over front and under front. Now, what are they going to do against a 30? Now, what are they going to do when the Sam linebacker, when the weak half, when the free safety is adding to the box right at the snap? So as much as possible, we want to make the offensive line have to block all their rules and worry about real, realistically 11 potential rushers. The field corner is likely never going to be in the pressure, but all 11 other guys could potentially be in the pressure and that, that puts a lot more stress on them getting their count right and blocking rules right. Um, in terms of takeaways, again, like you're just going to get more interceptions in zone coverage versus man coverage. And so our man pressures, those are more likely to be in second down situations where we're trying to deny an, uh, a completion. You're going to force more incompletions in man coverage, certainly, but in terms of actually getting takeaways or getting interceptions, you're, you've just got a much higher likelihood of having that happen when guys have their eyes inside and can see the ball come out of the quarterback's hand as opposed to playing with their back to them. And then the other big one is generating more negative plays. And so and there's all kind of studies out there that if you can create one negative play for an offense on a drive, they're going to score any amount of points less than 30% of the time if they have a negative play. And especially in Canadian football, where you've only got the two downs to deal with, if you can generate a negative play on a first down, you've got a great opportunity to flip the field and get them off the field right now. And so I think in Canadian football, especially the value of creating a negative play goes up. You don't have two downs to recover um, if you take a loss on first down. So uh, I think creating negative plays, there's a high value on that in terms of how it dictates the game to the offense. Um, and then just before I talk a little bit more about how we'll game plan it, this is a, a look at kind of the results we had with it over this past season. So we had 171 snaps this past year, um, you know, including all the playoffs and everything uh, of our fire zone. So almost 50% of our pressures were some type of zone blitz. Um, we allowed 4.7 yards per play. The big one there is the nine explosive plays allowed in 171 snaps. So if you keep explosive plays, you'd ideally like to be just under 5% of your total snaps are an explosive play and you're doing pretty well. Um, and then the one I put at the bottom there is our success rate versus run and pass plays. And so the numbers don't necessarily seem extremely high, but when you look at how you're factoring in your success rate for us on first down, we want to give up four yards or less. And then second or third down, it's whatever they need for the first down. We're trying to give up less than that. And so if you can get anywhere near 60%, you know, in, in the time we spent kind of studying this, um, then you're doing pretty well. Typically, the numbers are a lot closer to the low 50s. Um, and so it, it was fairly successful when you look at the fact that we're able to do a good job on first down and getting off the field on second. And we didn't give up a lot of explosive plays in these type of pressures. Um, so looking at the run game specifically and what we're looking at for game plan, I'll go through just a couple thoughts and then I'll show you one of our hit charts and um, give you a specific example of a team that we played and how we tried to attack it. For run, the starting point has to be what's their core run scheme. And so, you know, game planning for an opponent, really it's what are their three top run plays. And most teams are going to major in one or two of them, right? They're going to have their core run and then they're going to have their complement off of that you don't find a lot of teams that are going to run seven or eight different run schemes really, really well. And so whether it's run or pass, you're trying to figure out what's their identity. What do we need to take away? What do they do best? And for us, it's always, what are their three top run schemes? So whether it's inside zone, outside zone, you know, power counter gap schemes, it doesn't really matter what it is, but you're trying to figure out what are the runs that we need to stop. And that's going to change who we're blitzing and what type of pressures that we like about it. The big one that we'll always look at is where's the point of attack. And a lot of that comes down to the formation. So it's going to be different, you know, if there's a fullback in the game or a five receiver set in the game. Um, 
But in terms of blitzing the run game, I think the most important factor is what type of run scheme and then where's the likely point of attack. And so we'll break that down to inside, off tackle and perimeter. So, you know, inside zone, trap plays, wham plays, those would be all inside hitting plays. The gap schemes are typically more off tackle hitting plays. So like power and counter tend to get grouped in that off tackle category. And then the perimeter runs would be like your jet sweeps and your tosses and your outside zone plays. Um, once you get past the scheme part of it, now you got to look at the exact personnel on the other team. So how successful are they going to be picking up, you know, different stunts and pressure? You get a feel for that, um, you know, as you go through their previous three or four games or whatever you're breaking down. But I think one of the things that I see a lot of guys talk about is it goes immediately to, okay, what's their personnel? And you're going to find inevitably examples of them missing a stunt or a blitz pickup. And you tend to hone in on that one thing, but maybe over the course of the game, they actually do pretty well. I think for us in game planning our zone pressures versus run, it is much more scheme based and we want to know what type of run plays you're going to run. And then where's the point of attack going to be and try to put as many guys um, at the likely point of attack as we can. And I kind of talked about it earlier, but adding non-box defenders to the box count of the snap is a huge part of what we're trying to do in attacking the run game. And so let's say it's an off tackle team. If we know that the poor have a good idea, the point of attack is going to be off tackle strong. You know, if you put the Sam in the mic right there, that creates one effect and it could be all right, but the offensive line already has those guys in the count. What if we put the strong half back in the free safety in the strong half tackle area? Those guys aren't immediately in the offensive lines count and that's much more difficult pickup. And so those are a couple of thoughts in terms of how we try to attack the run game with our zone pressures. If we're looking at um, attacking the pass game, same kind of idea. We're trying to figure out what, what are their core protections. And again, you'll, you'll see a couple different things. The odd team you play will kind of sit in one thing and then that obviously makes life easier. But most teams you can pin it down to like, we're going to see one of two things in this situation. So, you know, it could be like your half slide, your full slide or gap protection. Are they a big on big team? You're going to attack those differently with different pressures and different blitz pass. But the starting point is always what are their core protections? What's their go-tos? And then the immediate after that is, okay, where's the running back going to be in protection? And when you start looking at um, attacking their worst protectors, the big one is always how can we get that running back in protection? How can we get him one-on-one -on -one with one of our best rushers, whether that's taking a, a defensive lineman off the ball and bring him from depth. If we have a linebacker who's a really adept blitzer, how can we get him matched up on the running back? How is he a blitz pickup? Like some backs, they stink at it. Some are very good at it and you got to factor that in. Does he do a good job getting up to the line of scrimmage and meeting the blitzer at the line, or is he taking on him on really deep where we can just pull him into the quarterback's lap? And the other one that, you know, plays into it a little bit, and this doesn't come up a ton, but it comes up like once a year, you'll have a team that, that is really good at getting the running back involved in the pass game. And so if one thought could be to sub personnel and get a, a smaller guy in at the positions where they're going to get matched up with the back. But I think one of the easiest things to do in that situation, how can we just keep that back in protection first? So rather than worrying about how are we going to cover this guy, if we can figure out where he's going to be in protection or who he's checking before he gets out on his route, well, if we can bring that guy, now he can't get out for his route. He's got to stay and protect, and you've eliminated that concern of having to cover that guy or getting a really good receiving back matched up on a linebacker. So that comes into play a little bit. Then it goes to the quarterback, right? So how does he handle pressure? And, and really from the quarterback and the offensive coordinator, what are their answers? And so when you start game planning for an opponent, if you look at plus one pressures, for example, there's all different things that you could do to beat it, right? You can throw hot and get the ball out. You can try to bomber guys in um, and protect longer to throw a deep shot. You can try double moves if you bring guys into the box. You can try to throw screens and get the ball out right now. There's all different things that you could do, but every offensive coordinator is probably going to have their one to two answers that you know they're going to go to against those type of pressures. And so you're trying to get that feel as you go through it. How does the quarterback respond to pressure? Does he do a good job hanging in there? 
you know, what are their pressure answers? Are they just good? If we bring the Sam, are they always going to try to replace that guy and throw hot right now? If that's the case, you probably want to spin a guy down behind the guy you're blitzing to put him in that area. Are they always trying to throw away from the pressure? You know, are they going to use a bunch of double cadence to try to flush it out before the snap? Are they going to try to max pro you and throw the ball downfield? Um, but beyond just the scheme, you're trying to figure out what are their answers in situations where they think they're going to see blitz. And then the last one I put there is who's their worst alike, right? And so if you can, in lieu of getting the back in protection, if you know there's an offensive lineman on the other team that struggles or struggles with uh, picking up blitz looks, if we can get that guy matched up again on one of our better rushes, then that's to our benefit as well. Um, and so this is just an example of, um, from one of our games this past year of a hit chart. So I know it's a little hard to see here, but I kind of circled the, the relevant points. So this is how we would game plan our pressures week to week. We would have a hit chart for every formation that they put on film. So this set here, you can see at the top, this would be like a 22 wing week formation here. So two by two with the fullback set week. This would be how many times they put that on film and then kind of your run pass breakdown at the top. But these are the relevant ones for our pressures right here. And so this section right here would be their run game hit chart. And so if you look at this team in terms of what they did in the run game, they didn't have a single snap in the games we scouted um, out of this formation where they ran the ball strong, nothing perimeter strong, off tackle strong, inside strong. Now, if you come over to the weak side out of this formation, they didn't have anything inside week, but they had seven snaps off tackle week and four snaps perimeter week. So in situations where we're thinking we're getting run out of this, you know, in terms of the pressures that we want to be in, it doesn't make a ton of sense to be bringing the Sam or the strong halfback here. Now we want to be bring that weak half or the weak corner, um, the will linebacker, but we want to be putting guys in that off tackle box to the weak side of the formation because that's likely where they're going to be running the ball out of this set um, the other one down here this would be their protection box right and so 77 for us would be a seven man protection with both backs blocking off the edge weak and that offensive line sliding away and so that was their number one protection here by far they had nine snaps of that and so the nice thing with this is when you look at this, okay, where would we want to be attacking in the run game? We want to put guys off tackle week or perimeter week. Where are their running backs going to be in protection? Well, their number one protection is both backs off the edge week. So you can just hammer this with weak side pressure. And if it's run, you're going to be sending guys right to the point of attack. If it's drop back pass, if you bring two guys off that weak side edge, well, the fullback and tailback are going to have to pick them up. And now you've kind of wasted their offensive line in protection. And so we would go through every formation. You try to set your pressures off whatever you can, but that's just one example um, of what we would look at in terms of game planning our pressure, just because in a lot of the other ones that I've been doing, that's kind of the consistent question that comes up. But I, like I said, I think finding the point of attack in the run game and then where the running backs are going to be in protection, those are the big ones that we look at. Um, so th this is one example that I put in here. This would be uh, like a day one pressure that we would put in against a, a one back team or a 5R team. And so this would just be a field fire zone for us here where we're bringing the Sam and the Mike. Um, the couple of things to talk about here, and I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the front. I'll talk a little bit about the two inside underneath you guys in coverage. The rest of it essentially amounts to however you guys teach your double hold. Um, but this would be a, a base pressure, like I said, day one install for us where we're going to bring the Sam and Mike off the strong edge. So in terms of our overload pressures here, this field end, he has what we call long stick technique, right? So a stick would be a one gap movement. Long stick means you're going over two gaps. So this field end has to get all the way down to that strong A gap. What we tell any of our guys when they've got a long stick technique is your key is that play side guard. Okay, so he's going to adjust his alignment. He can stem all the way down to the outside armpit of that offensive tackle. He can't get any tighter than the armpit. 
If he does, it's going to alert the offensive line that he's coming inside and they can potentially pass that off. So we tell him he can cheat his alignment a little bit, but he can't get any tighter than that armpit at the offensive tackle. He's got to be on his outside shoulder when the ball snap. He's going to load his weight on his outside foot. So in this diagram, it would be his left foot. He's got like 95% of his weight on his left foot. And as soon as the ball snapped, he wants to push off hard off that left foot. And he's got to take a lateral step and get as much width as he can with his right foot. His eyes are going to be on that guard, like I said. And now his reaction all comes off that guard. So it's as simple as if the guard steps to him, he's got to cross face and get in that A gap right now. If that guard steps away from him, he's got no chance to get in the A gap. So now we tell him he's got a chase technique so he can get flat down the line of scrimmage and he's running right down the heel line off the outside hip of that offensive guard. Um, if that tackle gets in decent position to cut you off, you would bring that uh, outside hand nice and tight and it's a tight arm over and then flat down the line of scrimmage. But really the two keys that we work for him, guard two, I got a cross face, guard away from me, I'm chasing right down the heels of the offensive line right now. Um, on this pressure, Sam is the outside blitzer. He's the contain rusher for us. So any of our second level guys, if they're the edge blitzer, we'll tell them they've always got, con got contained. They're looking right through the outside hip of that offensive tackle. So they're key in the end man on the line of scrimmage. If that hip comes to me, I got to set the post right now and keep the ball inside of me. So I'm keeping my outside shoulder free. If that hip disappears away from me, I'm looking down the line for anybody coming back to kick me out. If I see anybody coming back across to kick me out, then I'm going to keep my outside shoulder free. So I'm going to hard join and keep the ball to my inside. If nobody's coming back to kick me out, now I'm going to get into my shuffle. And it's the exact same um, as your shuffle or serve technique that we, you would teach to your defensive end if they're playing the quarterback. So they want to be right along the heels of the offensive line, right in that hip pocket of the tackle with square pads and they're keeping their body in that C gap until they sort out if the quarterback or running backs got the ball, but they're a quarterback responsible player there. Um, this technique right here for a mic, this would be a scrape blitz for us. And so his eyes are looking right at the outside hip of that defensive end. Um, for our Sam, our edge blitzer, he's going first. So we want him at the line of scrimmage right at the snap of the ball. If you're a scrape blitzer, so you're coming from depth, we don't want you getting into the line of scrimmage. You want to give time for this long sticking end to clear. And then you want to be scraping paint right off his outside hip. And really you want that end to clear. And then you're hitting it hundred miles an hour right off his outside hip. Um, and so he's looking right at the outside hip of that defensive end. If the guard comes to him, he's got to post the B gap right now. Again, if that tackle steps down with the defensive end, now he becomes a chase player as well since the Sam's got contained and he's playing the quarterback. So now he can turn his pads and go flat down the line of scrimmage as well. Um, and so that gets into, I think, know how to clip earlier where they had two off the edge on the backside of zone. You would get a similar look here where the Sam's playing the quarterback and now that Mike can potentially make the play running flat down the heel line and he doesn't have to worry about the quarterback at all. He can go straight to the tailback. Um, the rest of this, our field tackle here, he's just got a stick technique. So he's one gap. He's got to cross the center space to balance the rush. So he would be key in this far guard. And then our three technique tackle here, we call this a cop technique. So cop just means you're a contained through B gap player. And so he's playing his normal B gap versus run. So if he gets any kind of run scheme, he's staying in the B gap right now. If it's pass or high hat pass, if he can win through the B gap, then we tell him to win through the B gap and get contained. If he can still keep the quarterback inside of him winning through the B gap right now, great. He's got to know he's got an end dropping outside of him. So if that tackle is coached up well, as soon as he sees that end drop, he's going to look back inside and look to pin whoever's working to contain. So we tell him he's got to be really, really disciplined. If I can win through the B gap, great. Win through the B gap, get contained. If that tackle slams down in you at all, you got to be really disciplined. You can't keep going B gap. You got to work to cross his face and get back and contain. Um, so that's kind of the coaching for the front here. In terms of the inside part of the coverage, you know, this example is out of a two high look. So again, we talked about 
um, making the quarterback have to make all his decisions post snap. Out of this look, we could be easily playing any kind of cover two or cover four look. So we're trying to show one thing and then create a different picture right at the snap of the ball. Our free safety would be spinning down to replace the Sam, right? So that's kind of the example I talked about earlier, where if a team is just throwing and replacing the blitzers right now, you want to drop somebody in behind the pressure. Um, and then our weak half would be coming to the post here. Our boundary end who's dropping, the coaching for him on his drop, first of all, he's a run first player. And so we tell him he's got his normal run responsibility. So if he gets any kind of down block, he's got a shuffle. If he gets a base block, he's still posting the C gap. As soon as he recognizes hi-hat, now he can get into his drop and he's working 10 to 12 yards deep directly over top of the ball. Uh, and then our Will linebacker here, the one kind of difference we give our linebackers He's essentially replacing the weak half here, so he's the curl flat player. And so the one difference we would give our linebackers if they're playing a, a curl flat technique over our defensive backs, we would tell him, your technique is punch and widen. So I want to be right on the inside armpit of that number two weak. I can't allow anything to beat me to my flat. And your number one job here is to jam the vertical of number two and protect the seam for that weak corner. So we want to be right on the inside armpit of that uh, two weak. We want to punch through the inside breastplate, and then I can wide into my flat after that. So we try to keep it as simple as possible for the linebackers or the defensive line when we're in coverage. And really, you're just trying to get them to the space you need to take away as opposed to if a halfback was playing a whole technique, it would be a little bit more nuanced. Um, and then I put this one in just to give you an idea of some of the things you can do to change up coverage wise. This is really the exact same pressure up front, right? It's just a different looking coverage. And so this is with a weak cut look, you know, if you're a match team or a quarters team, there's no reason you couldn't run this pressure with any of that. You could play a triangle over here and box to the field or triangle on two and three. So you can fit the pressures to the coverage um, or the coverages that you like. It's the same thing up front, what, like I said, but now we've got the Will linebacker replacing the Sam and Mike Strong, and then the end would be dropping off, out off a two week. The big difference here, if you're going to play any kind of cut scheme with your pressure, um, or if you're playing like a match concept, now you don't have a three to two dropper, we would call them hook to paint droppers. And so they're going to drop to the inside receiver. So the will would be dropping to number three. If he gets any kind of outside radical or vertical, it's the same drop as before. But if he gets any kind of inside radical here, he's not coming down on it, but he's got to mirror that route from depth and protect the middle of the field because we're short that over the ball dropper. So just to show you the previous example, here, boundary end would be dropping in the middle of the field. So if three strong um, gives you radical under, right, the free safety can expand to number two and he can pass that because you've got an end over the ball. If you're going to do it with any kind of split field coverage or cut concept, now if that number three is radical inside, he's got to mirror that back towards the middle of the field because this end's got to push his drop all the way to number two. Lead, right, so there's a little bit of nuance if you're going to change the coverage up for the inside guys, but the pressure remains the same. And then I'll just show one more example here um, and then get into some of the film. So this would be more of a two back run pressure that we run. So this is a very similar pressure up front, but now we're bringing the Sam and the strong half back. Um, and so we like this more against two back teams because it would give the Mike a lot of coverage responsibility against one back. Now it, everything is the same as that first example but the free safety has got to know he's replacing that strong half instead of the Sam. So now he becomes that curl flat defender to the field. The big difference here, if we're bringing two guys from outside of the box and still got his long stick technique, that strong half is still an edge blitz player. So he's key in the end man. If he's to him, he's going to set the edge. If he's away, he's going to shuffle. If we're bringing our scrape blitzer from outside of the box, he's going to key this end man as well. If the end man steps down, then he's going to do the same thing the Mike would have, and he'll chase flat down the heels of the offensive line, and he's a dive player. If this tackle steps out and bases him, he's got to cross his face to get into the B gap right now. And so there's just a little bit of difference if you're the scrape blitzer from inside or outside of the box, but otherwise the pressure is essentially the same. 
Mike becomes that hook curl player, and then our boundary end still has his over the ball drop. Okay, so those are a couple examples. And the last thing I had here before I get into some film, um, like I said, one of the things I like about these pressures is once, once they learn the concept, it becomes really easy to change up the look week to week or provide a bunch of different looks for the offense, depending on what you uh, want to take away. So th this is how we will create different looks with the same pressure. Um, we have one term that would indicate who's blitzing. And then if we want to change the blitz path, that would just be a second term that's added to it. And so one of the things you see with guys when they're adding pressures every single week is it's always, okay, we've got to add a new word now. What are we going to call this blitz? What are we going to call that blitz? For us, well, if the Sam and Mike are coming, that's just one word and it's going to be the same thing every week. And if we want to change up how they're blitzing or who's responsible for what gap, now you're just tagging one word on the end of it. So there's a couple examples here at the bottom. Our long stick would be our base way. So that's what I already talked about with the end going two gaps over edge blitzer and a scrape blitzer behind it. This would be, could be the Sam and Mike again, but now we're changing the blitz path where that end is going to stay in contain. The Mike backer is going to come down early, threaten the outside shoulder of this guard and cross his face to the A gap. And that Sam is going to show outside like he's the edge blitzer. And then he's going to rush tight through the inside hip of that end. And he's actually going to be responsible for B gap. And so it, it doesn't matter what you call them or what they are. But I think in terms of coming up with um, how you're going to classify your pressures, how you're um, teaching the terminology to the guys and trying to make the learning as simple as possible, I, I think that's really the best way to do it is one term to indicate who's blitzing. And then if you want to change the path up off of that, it's just a tag on the end of it, very similar to how offensive guys would do if they want to change one route within a concept, as opposed to calling something completely different. And then, you know, when I was talking earlier about long stick technique and scrape blitz, I, I think one of the big things that you want to do if you're going to carry a lot of stuff is you want to make um, as many things that are same as as possible. And so when we talk about teaching things conceptually to the guys, we'll just teach them on day one, here's how, or here's what a long stick technique is. I'm keying the guard. I need to be on the outside armpit of that offensive tackle of the snap. Guard to me, I'm crossing face, guard away, chase. And you hammer, that's how you always run a long stick. And now if you do install a new pressure, you can just say, okay, on this, you've got a long stick technique and they know all the coaching points because you put it in from day one. And so I think coming up with terminology for each technique is really important. Scrape blitz, edge blitz, long stick. And that makes it a lot easier to change up looks week to week. So I'll pull up uh, some film now to show you guys a few examples. All right, is the film up there, Sharps? Yep, you're good. Okay, let me just hit optimize. Here. Okay, so this first example I put in here, not necessarily because the blitz gets home, but I think it gives a good picture um, of really what we're trying to accomplish with our zone pressures here. And so a lot of times what you see, like, when you're what sorry. A lot of times what you see when you're watching clinics is, you know, somebody gets turned loose by the offensive line or whatever the case is. They don't pick somebody up. Those are obviously good, but I think one of the things to understand with this is you're not necessarily, sorry, what's going on here? One second, guys. Yeah, so I'm just pulling this back up here, guys. Okay. Sorry. All right, let's try this. All right, so like I was saying, one of the things that comes up a lot when you're watching stuff about pressure is you inevitably just see the clips that hit. 
I think this play is a really good example of what we're trying to get done. So on this play, we're going to get full slide protection to the boundary here. They've got their fullback and their running back blocking off this strong edge here. And so what I like about this, this is that same pressure I was talking about with the Sam and Mike blitzing off of the long stick defensive end here. And if you pause it right here, right, we've got our Mike linebacker matched up one-on-one -on -one with the, uh, the fullback. We've got our Sam linebacker matched up one-on-one -on -one with the tailback. And we've wasted five of their offensive linemen with three of our rushers, right? Our boundary ends dropping out and we've got their five offensive linemen blocking our three down. And we've got one-on-ones in protection with both of their running backs. And so they do a good job picking it up, right? They're still pretty deep. And so you've got immediate pressure right in the quarterback's lap here, which maybe you can't step into the throw as well but they don't always necessarily have to hit home, but you're really just trying to create these matchups that are favorable. And rather than tacking their five offensive linemen, if we can make their back stay in and protect, then we feel like that's a win for us. Right. And then in terms of the coverage, this is kind of that too high look that we were talking about earlier. Right. So our free safety and our weak half showing high where we could be playing some kind of quarter scheme and then right on the snap, trying to spin the free safety down behind our Sam um, to replace the pressure. All right, so this is another example, same pressure, but now this is gonna be a slightly different blitz path here. So this is still our Sam and our Mike rushing. This would be our second and long defense now, right? So we've got a three-man front in. This is a look that will give a lot on second and long where we've got everybody in the front five yards plus off the ball and trying to confuse the protection or the quarterback or give them issues in terms of identifying who's actually going to be in the rush. The coverage is the exact same here. And if you look at our weak halfback here, He's just outside the hash marks on the 25 yard line here. I like that he's showing down like he could be spinning down and then he's spinning to the middle of the field right at the snap. We're still bringing our Sam and our Mike. So our free safety is going to replace in behind our Sam here. This would be that lion blitz path that I showed you guys earlier. So we're trying to make this look the same as a long stick. But now our Mike's going to be threatening the outside half of this guard. So outside shoulder of 52 here. He's going to cross face at the last second. Our Sam is showing pressure outside, and then he's going to be tight off the inside hip of that end, right? And so up until right about there, everything looks the exact same as our long stick technique, and then it's a completely different blitz path for the offensive line to pick up, and we get a good hit on the QB. Okay, and then this is the exact same as the previous one here. So again, this is out of a three-man front on second and long. This time we're bringing the Sam and the Mike to the side of the running back. And so they do a better job here picking it up. But again, if you look at this, now we've got their running back one-on-one -on -one in protection against our Sam. And so again, we feel like that's a good matchup for us. The one kind of coaching point here, if you're running this stuff out of a 30 especially, but even if it's that nose tackle just crossing the center's face, any of the interior guys, we always tell the tackles, you can never work back to the pressure. You always got to keep working away from the pressure. So if you look at 77 here, he's crossing the center's face to that weak A gap. Okay. If he gets doubled like he does here, if he gets stopped on his initial rush, he can't counter back to the strong side where the Sam and Mike are coming from. He's got to keep working to cross that guard's face and try to fill that weak B gap. He does a okay job not a great job here you can see how there's almost an escape lane that opens up in that weak b gap and he starts working outside just enough to influence the quarterback back up in the pocket um, but you'd like to see him try to cross that guard's face but for those interior guys the big coaching on that is they can never work back to the pressure they've got to keep working away from the pressure Okay, and then this would be one more example, of that same pressure, bring the Sam and Mike from the strong side. And so our Mike is threatening that outside shoulder of the guard. Again, our, our defensive end to the field here, he's going to stay high and contain. 
our Sam could do a better job here showing like he's an edge blitzer. So you'd like to see him a little bit wider. And now he's going to be tight through the inside hip of that defensive end. All right. So you'd like to do a better job here showing um, like we're running, running the long stick, but we get the hit on the quarterback there. And then this is another look at, again, a coverage change up. So this is that second coverage I put up. All right. So now we're playing like a weak cut concept here. So in theory, they could throw hot to number three because our, our weak inside backer has got to come all the way across to replace the blitzers here. But this week, we felt like they were going to try to work that weak side. So now we're bringing the pressure we like. But we've still got that weak corner down on number one, and we've still got our will linebacker dropping right to the hip of number two with help over the top. So you can change up the pressures week to week depending on where you think they're going to throw or what you want to take away. Okay, and then this would be a, be a look at the same pressure from the boundary side here. So now this is going to be, again, out of a 30 front. This is our will and our weak inside backer. So, again, that weak end is going to stay in contain. He's got to get high right now, contain rush on the quarterback. 55, he's threatening the outside half of the guard, and then he's got to try to cross face and win inside. And our Will's just coming into the picture late here. He does a much better job selling up field for a step or two. And then you can see him plant hard off that outside foot and go tight through the inside hip of that defensive end to get the hit on the QB. And then this is a much better job by our nose continuing to work away from the pressure. So he's got to cross the center space to get to that strong A. If he gets any pressure there, he's got to fight the pressure and keep working to strong B. So he's an A to B rusher there. And I'll just show a couple more. Okay, so th this is a different look now. This would be an inside pressure. So now we're bringing our Mike and our Will linebacker in both A gaps here. Okay, so against quarterbacks that are either immobile or panic against immediate pressure in their face, if you know you're getting a half slide protection, what I like about this is you know you're going to get a one-on-one -on -one with the running back right in the quarterback's lap right now. The big thing you'd be looking at here when you're scouting this is how well does that running back step up and meet the blitzer in protection, right? If he does a great job stepping up and meeting him at the line, you don't necessarily like it as much. This is a great example where you can see the running back is really, really deep in pro. And so he's taking that blitzer on so close to the quarterback that if we can just bench him back into the QB, that's probably going to get him off his spot right away like it does here. Um, so again, you don't necessarily love that as much against the quarterback that's able to run or that's going to influence him out of the pocket. But if you know that he struggles with immediate pressure, you know the running back doesn't do a good job getting up to the line of scrimmage to meet the rusher, um, that's a good way to attack that type of protection. I'll show the coverage here quickly. So again, this is just three deep double hold. They're in a two by three set here. So our free is spinning down over three weak and he's that weak hook curl player. Our rush should be getting out late to the middle hole here. And then our Sam's just replacing the free safety in the post here. Right. And so you take away the initial hots. The only rows they have initially are short and outside the numbers. And then you've got immediate pressure in the quarterback space with a good matchup on the running back here that is going to be difficult for him to hang in and go through his progression afterwards. Okay, and then same thing here. This is a weak side pressure again, where we're going to bring the weak half and the will linebacker here. This is that long stick technique again. So our weekend here, 55, I don't like this. So if you pause it right here, the ball's just being snapped and see how that weekend is already on the inside shoulder of number 53, right? So he's getting way too tight here. He can't get any tighter than that outside armpit. That's going to make it a lot easier for that left tackle to pass this off. Right, and they really should be able to pick this up because they're sliding that way. The guard makes a mistake here. But one of the issues we have here is that end getting way too tight and letting everybody know that he's going inside. Our half is the edge blitzer here, and then this is a good look at that scrape blitz by our will. He could even be a little bit tighter to the end here, but he really just wants to scrape paint and brush that outside hip of that end as tight as he can. Right, and even though we don't get what we want here, we're running it to the slide, it's still a difficult pickup for him to sort out. Okay, and I'll show, I'll show like two of the examples where we're adding some defensive backs to the run. Okay, so 
This is a second and short situation here. It's second and two. And they've got a fullback on the field here. He's lined up at one strong. So you're still getting your two back run game stuff here. So when you're looking at teams that are going to run, you know, a lot of power, run the ball to the fullback, you know, that now we're going to bring the Sam and the strong halfback to the side of the fullback here and try to blow up the likely point of attack. So this is that second pressure I showed, right? Sam is the scrape blitzer from outside of the box. Our strong halfback, he's the contained blitzer. They do a pretty good job tangling their blitz off the waggle, the receivers here. So we want them right at the line of scrimmage at the snap. Our free safety is rotating down to replace the strong half, and our weak half is spinning to the post here. This is a good look at what we want to get, you know, against gap run here. They're running a counter scheme back to the strong side. Now we get two guys immediately attacking the line of scrimmage outside of that down block. So our Sam does a good job taking out the first puller. Strong half sets the edge and keeps the ball inside. And what I like about this, now you've wasted their pullers. Like we waste their first puller on that Sam running flat down the line. Now they've got to try to dig out our Mike linebacker with the receiver instead of getting one of those offensive linemen blocking the mic. So in terms of matchups, you know, you're trading a defensive back to take out that first offensive lineman. But now they've got to deal with the second level player with the receiver. And so that, that puts the matchups back in our advantage and our Mike's able to beat the block of the receiver and make the tackle here short of the sticks on second down. So that's one example of um, a run pressure. Okay, and then this would be the same pressure again to the strong side here. So now they've got a sixth offensive lineman in the game at tight end here. So now we want to, again, bring the pressure to where that tight end is. So again, our Sam's able to take out that first puller. We've got two guys immediately attacking the line of scrimmage um, outside or off in that off tackle area where the ball's likely to hit. And again, you can see how clean our mic is here as he reads the pull and works over the top of the double team here. They're really never able to get a hat on either our strong half or our mic backer there. So again, it's a good way. Um, to cause issues in the, in the blocking scheme for the offensive line. You know, you make the block, box defenders have to block defensive backs who are adding to the box late. Um, and now you free up your second level guys, your Mike linebacker, and they've got to try to dig those guys out with receiver, which again, tilts the matchups back in your favor. Um, so I think that's all I've got for you guys for tonight, if there's any questions. That was awesome. So uh, if you guys have any questions, just go ahead and unmute yourselves and you can ask. Go ahead. Hey, Scott. It's Coach Van Marker. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Good. Uh, just one question for you. When you showed your hit list and then you showed that the fullback lined up weak and that they weren't running to the field, obviously you don't get to determine the formation that the offense is going to be in. Will you just tag that as a uh, kind of a check with me, five man fire pressure. And yeah. So we would have a call it on the field. Yeah. We would have a call for um, where we want to set the blitz to. So like for a full, if it's off the fullback, it would be plus or minus. So we would say plus means we're bringing the blitz to wherever the fullback is minus is away from wherever the fullback is. If we were setting it off the tailback, we would call it two or away. So we would just say two if we want to bring it to the tailback away if it's opposite the tailback. So we would have a, a tag to indicate where we want to bring the blitz from. And again, Canadian football, sometimes you can do that. If it's like Western's fullback moving all over the place right up until the snap, then you can't necessarily even set it to the fullback still. And so that causes issues. But if you get a team where the, the fullback's going to be more stationary or it's a tight end or a sixth offensive lineman that you set it to, then it's an easy way to be right more than not. Okay, great. Thank you very much. No problem.